Hello, welcome to White Baby Gardening and Worm Farm. Today we are going to be discussing some of the challenges that we face as gardeners. And if there are things that can be done to solve some of these challenges. So please feel free to share some of the challenges that you have been facing this year while growing your garden. And if you so desire, please share what steps you have taken or planning to take to overcome these challenges. It has been a rather crazy year for gardeners, for a lot of gardeners. Some of us, the challenge vary from region to region. Weather seemed to be one of the biggest challenge that gardeners are facing this year. Some gardeners have experienced a lot of rain leading to flooding. Some gardeners have experienced extreme heat and stuff like that. So the list goes on and on where challenges in the garden are concerned. So as I mentioned, some has faced the challenge of having to deal with constant rain leading to flooding in their gardens. So what can be done to minimize some of these challenges caused by too much rain? For one, if you are planting in the ground and you're prone to flooding, then you might want to create drainage so that water won't settle in your garden. Sometimes that's not possible for you to create drainage, but where, whenever you can, it would be a good idea to do so. There are various ways that you can use to create drainage, whether you're going to be digging trenches that leads the water away. <laughs> oh, hi, Melanie. Yeah, so you can dig trenches or other method to drain the water away from your garden or to create a slope away from the area where you're planting so that the water will tend to run off rather than to settle in the garden. Now, depending on how bad the flooding is, <clears throat> it may be necessary not to plant in the ground because there are some region that tends to get far more rain than others. So if you're someone who gets a lot of rain and you have water coming up to your knee or above, then it might be a good idea to plant in raised beds or in containers rather than planting in the soil. Oh, hi, Nikki. How are you? Yes. Yeah, so you, if you have a situation where you have water coming up to your ankle, your knee, or higher in your garden, then you might want to consider planting in containers or in raised beds. Now, there are various, depending on your circumstance, there are various ways that you can do container gardening or raised beds in order to minimize damage from flooding. Hi, Helpy. You can't stay and listen right now, but you're going to let it play as long as you can, okay? Then I'll listen to the replay later, but have a great night, everyone. I hope your gardens are well. Okay, same to you, my dear. Thank you for the support as usual. Take care. Yes, yeah, so if you experience flooding from year to year and you're going to be planting in planters, these you can elevate off the ground. And based on your experience in your region, say the flooding usually affects you up to a foot high. Then you're going to plant your containers higher than that. The bottom of your containers, you put them on stands so that they're higher than a foot. That way, the water that catch in your container can drain out and your container don't have to sit in that water. Because as we go further, we're going to discuss a little bit about some of the damages that can be caused by too much rain. Yes, and if you're building raised bed, again, it depends on the levels of water that you're going to have. 
Sometimes you can just build a regular raised bed, not too high. Sometimes you might have to build a raised bed, but you don't want to make your raised bed deep because then it's going to require a lot of material for you to fill those raised beds. So what you can do is build your raised beds and put them on legs. That way you don't have to have too much material to fill the raised beds. And at the same time, you are elevating these raised bed off the ground so that the water can drain away and your plants will have a better chance of surviving let's see melanie says i have had that problem in the back of my garden the rainwater always take long to soak away okay yes quite a few youtubers this year you see where they post where their water the entire garden is just covered in water it can be a challenge to deal with because plants don't really like too much water unless it is a water plant so it can be a challenge to deal with but sometimes there are ways around it sometimes not yes so another issue that gardeners face when there is too much rain is that too much water on your plants can lead to fungal diseases of the plants most fungus that grows on plants love warm condition that has a lot of humidity or a lot of moisture so these this is one of the challenges that gardeners face when they are in environments that get too much rain Sometimes it is a case where it's just a one-off situation, like maybe one particular season you have too much rain. Sometimes it can be a yearly occurrence. But either way, it can be frustrating when there is too much rain, especially because of the fungal diseases that may result from it. Now, when this happens, the plant may slow down a bit. Sometimes some of the leaves will slowly fall off the plant sometimes some of the plants may lose all of its leaf if that happens and the plant is a perennial then you don't need to worry about it because even if the plant does not regrow its leaf that year the following year it will regrow the leaves so you don't need to worry about perennial plants where that is concerned most plants however are able even if they end up with some form of fungal disease most plants are able to survive it to an extent. They can still grow and produce fruits. They will just shed a few leaves. Some plants might not be able to. So you just have to replant them. Hopefully you have enough growing time in order for them to actually go to fruition. One thing that you can also do to minimize these plant disease is to ensure that when you're planting your plants you have sufficient space in between them because the crowdier the plant is then the less airflow you're going to have and then with less airflow created more room for these fungal diseases to spread the hair flow will help to dry out the, the plants faster than if you have a lot of plants gathered together so plant them with sufficient space in between them especially if you live in areas where you consistently get a lot of rain year after year another thing that you can do most times the garden might not be very level and so you might have depression some areas in the garden a good idea is to fill in these de depression because you don't want water to settle in them for any extended period of time. So fill out these areas so that the water can run off. I keep missing the live. Busy with the garden baking. Okay. No worries, my dear. There's always the replay if you so desire. This is actually a very busy time of year for most people because it is the summer. In the winter, you're cooped up inside and can't go out and have a lot of fun as you would like to. 
or do a lot of the things that you'd like to do outside. So this time of year, people are usually pretty busy. And in addition to having their secular work, a lot of people are gardening. So it will take a lot of a lot of your time. So it is understandable. And this time of year, people are busy. Oh, hi, Russell. Taking a break for the live, working with worms since waking today. Wow, busy all day. Eh? Still have to finish mixing prepared beddings and worm chow and had water and mixing all again. Okay, yes. Thanks for taking the time out, Russell. I know just how busy you've always been. Okay, so you're also baking, Melanie. Are you baking using stuff that you harvested from your garden? Okay, so we have looked at issues with too much rain and some of the steps that can be taken to reduce damage to the garden. So another issue that gardeners face and this is one of the main issues that i'm facing at the moment is heat wave and drought yes yeah, so we have been experiencing that in my region the heat wave usually each summer would have heat wave maybe once for the for the summer this time around we're having heat wave practically two or three times a month so it has been a rather crazy year. Now, what can you do if you are experiencing heat wave or drought in your region? Mulching is a very good idea. Hi, Herb and Kiki. Yes, yeah, so mulching is a good way to help to reduce the damage from the heat. For one, it is going to help to keep the root of the plants cool because the roots have less exposure. Two, it is going to help to trap the moisture that is in the soil, so the plant will have more moisture available. So mulching is one way of controlling the damage from heat or drought. The next thing about mulch is that if you can use mulch that is reflective, then that is good because then it will reflect the heat and minimize the damage. So grass clipping is one good way of using mulch around your plant because it is reflective. Let's see. Oh, hi, Stacy. Okay, you have a small baking business, rum cake. Ooh, I would enjoy some of that. It's a pity you're not close to me. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I would enjoy some of that. Okay, so another step that can be taken to minimize the damage is by watering your plants frequently. Yes, um, hi, Leafy Wiggy. It is hot. I think it's the last time I checked 36 degrees Celsius outside. So it is a hot one. I went out there rather early in the morning to water and then I went out later on just before I started the live in order to do a video but other than that I haven't really been out because it's just too hot but I guess that's something we're gonna have to get used to we don't know if it is gonna get better or worse so we just have to be prepared okay you ship local okay nice nice <laughs> okay so yeah so as i was saying water frequently and if you're watering your plants during a heat wave or during a drought you want to do so early in the morning as early as you possibly can because one you want to avoid heat scald and if you have seedlings that you are growing outdoors, you're going to need to water them more than once per day. For your lawn, 
you want to keep your grass at least around three inches tall because then it acts as a mulch or as a cover for the soil to help trap some of the moisture. So keeping your lawn grass around three inches help rather than cutting it low. Okay, so there are other things that you can do too. If you are experiencing heat wave, for one, you might choose to use shade cloth or you may choose to use row cover. Now, if you are using shade cloth, shade cloth comes in various grades. So if you are looking at shade cloth and it says 60%, it means that it will block out 60% of the sun. If it says 30%, it means it will block out 30% of the sun. So therefore, you have to know just how much of the heat you want to block out. And then that is going to determine the grade of shade cloth that you get. You can use your protective row cover, as I mentioned before. A good idea is always to plan ahead what you're going to do if this circumstance occur or if that circumstance occur because it's never the same from year to year there is always something different and so if you try to prepare for various outcomes then when the challenge occur you're better able to take action now one thing that you want to do when the time is hot is to look out for pests that actually love the heat so, for example, leaf hoppers, these tend to love the heat. So, be on the lookout for them. White flies do love the heat, they like the daylight. So, be on the lookout for pests that tend to love heat because during that time they tend to flourish a lot more. Now, if you're going to be watering your plants during the heat wave, a good idea, if you have the time to do so, is to water by hand because during heat wave it is usually recommended that you try to save on the amount of water that you use but then because the time is so dry you're going to need more water for your plants so the way that you're going to keep that balance between using too much water and providing the plants with sufficient water is to water by hand because then you can just water individual plants as, a, as opposed to water the entire garden. When you use things like irrigation, self-irrigation system, then that tend to water the entire garden. But then when you use, when you hand water, you can control just how much water you give to each plant. And then some plants love more water than others, so you have full control over that. Let's see, Melanie says, we are still getting rain and cool in the morning and evening. Okay, I could use some of that rain. <laughs> but then the farmers here are saying they don't want the rain now, even though we're having drought. They don't want the rain because we're not really getting the few times that it actually rained. We're not really getting much rain. All it is doing is damaging their crop. And I guess some of them are close to harvesting at the moment, so they don't really want the rain. But yes, I could use some. <laughs> it would be so nice if the rain could fall in areas where people actually want it and not fall in the areas where you don't want it. But that's not an option, so. Yes. So as I was saying, hand watering helps to control just how much each plant get why does my strawberry blooms turn brown that's a very good question but um unfortunately i don't know the answer to that one i've never experienced that so i don't know but maybe someone else on the live who have experienced it before or know the reason why i can answer that for you but sorry my dear i don't know the answer Okay, plants can be watered day in the days, in the early mornings, or at nights. 
There are some disadvantages though when you water at night because pests such as snails and other pests that tends to come out at night because it is cool when you water at night it keep the area cooler so these pests are more likely to come out so where possible water in the early morning and that will help to reduce the amount of these pests slugs and snails and others another thing that you can do only if we get years are turning brown as well yeah it would be interesting to find the answer to that oh, maybe i should jot it down so that i can look it up when i have the time Crop to writing. <laughs> okay, yes, so where were we? Yes, if you have to transplant during an heat wave, if you don't have to transplant, you can allow the seedlings to stay until the heat wave have passed. Sometimes the heat wave has is the case that we are experiencing here. It can last for a pretty long time but whenever it cools off you transplant during that period of time if however you the heat wave is just continuous then what you want to do if possible is to transplant your seedlings in cool areas so for example plant your transplant your crop where they are shaded by other plants that are already taller than they are and that will help to protect these young plants okay melanie you gave up on your on strawberries because you're not having any success with them yeah i'm sorry you had to give up mine seem to be doing very well in terms of production in fact this is the best year i've had with strawberries in terms of production but as I mentioned before in lives and videos, I'm not getting any of my strawberries because these birds, these magpies are eating all my strawberries. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to get them covered before they destroy all of, all of them. But little by little, I'm getting a few of them covered. okay so yes as i was saying you can transplant when the time is cooler in between heat waves or where possible you can transplant <laughs> leafy wiggy mud pie has got to eat healthy too yeah, they have to eat healthy, but I mean, go away, go and eat in the bushes where nobody care about the berries and stuff that grows there. Why do they want to eat what's in my garden? I don't have enough in my garden for me and them. I wish there was some way I could set some trap for them to get rid of them and let the other birds stay. Because since the magpie took over, I'm seeing less of the other birds. And I don't like that because the magpies are eating the young ones from other birds so if there was some way i could get rid of them without affecting the other birds that would be great let's see uh nikki says dying strawberry plants is usually because of underwatering I've never experienced where the root of where the blooms of my strawberry turned brown, but I have experienced my strawberry plants dying. But mine, when they die, is never from underwatering. 
and it's not from lack of nutrients so i'm not sure what it is that is killing them but for some reason quite a few of my strawberries this year didn't make it and i didn't see any sign of cut worms or anything they didn't seem to be cut down by cut worms but quite a few of them this year were doing well and then they just dry down let's see smart birds hang, hang around good gardeners yeah i wish they weren't so smart though <laughs> So I'll find some way, I'll find some way to get them under control, even if they want to hang around. Next year, all being well, I'll be putting some mesh around all the plants that they are affecting because I didn't reap any cherries this year and I had quite a lot on my cherry trees. My Saskatoon berries, I didn't reap any because of them and now they are destroying my strawberries. So next year i'm gonna to have to get them under control but i don't know what i'm going to do for my saskatoon berries it's quite a lot of bushes and they're pretty tall so i don't think i can afford all that mesh to put around it but i'll have to find some way to get them under control yes nikki nutrients deficiency can be another reason why strawberry plants die but from what um the Leafy Wiggy, was it? And um, Stacy saying it is the flowers on their plants that they're having issues with. It is not the actual plant, but just the flowers. Okay, so. Yeah, so as the weather condition continues to decline globally, there's not much that we can do to change that, but we can at least hope for the best and prepare for the worst so that when these trials are come, we can get the best possible outcomes. Now, as we keep growing new types of plants in our garden, one of the things that we're going to see happening is we're going to be having different types of pests that we are not used to having so once you're planting new crop be prepared it is a good idea to whenever you're going to plant a new type of crop to research the crop what type of pests usually affect it it would be a good idea if possible to find out the type of pests that are common in your community so that you can be prepared for them let's see melanie says the birds eat the slug pellets in my garden. I have to stop using it because I don't know if it will harm them. Oh, okay. I'll never really have issues with slugs, so I've never used slug pellets. If you have access to wood ash, you can use that for the slugs as well. So if you have a fire pit that you run and you have wood hash, it would be good to save those wood hash because they work very well for slugs. Nikki says, maybe the strawberry plants is getting too much heat causing stress. That is, that is a very strong possibility too because not just, um, it didn't happen with my strawberries, but every time we experience a heat wave, I noticed that the blossoms on a lot of my plants, my tomatoes, my peppers, they tend to turn brown and fall off. So you're, you're, you got a good point there, Nikki. It could be the heat that is causing it. And then Jamaica is not really an area where we generally grow strawberries, although more and more gardeners are growing strawberries and other fruits that we don't usually grow there but yes because jamaica is usually fairly warm not as hot as the heat wave we're having here but because jamaica is usually fairly warm that could be what is affecting it so planting it in an area where it is partially shaded would be a good idea and then you can figure out by moving some of your plants to cooler areas and see if it will make a difference Okay, Stacy. 
And then it says, I have some. We'll use that this evening. Okay, good. Let's see. Stacy says, I recently covered the area. I was thinking that that's the thing, Nikki. Okay, good. Let's see if it makes a difference. Hopefully it does. Okay. So where were we? Yeah, so we were talking about expecting different type of pests whenever you introduce new plants. It doesn't mean that because you have a new type of plant that you must get the pests that tend to affect these plants. That's not the case, but at least having an idea of the type of pests that affect these plants and how to deal with them, even if you don't get the type of treatment or whatever you need to deal with this issue, you have the knowledge beforehand so that when the issue come up, you can deal with it deal with it right away. You and no matter how good you are, how much plans you make for pest, you can always end up with different type of pest that you either never heard about or you've never experienced before. So there is always a chance that there will be pests that you have never heard about before. So one good practice that gardeners keep in mind is that whatever it is that you are growing, it is always a good idea when you go out in the mornings or whenever you're maintaining, maintaining your plants to observe each type of plant that you have when something changes with the plant, you should be able to tell because you're always monitoring your plants. You're always examining your plants. You're always able to tell when something is off with them. And then you can investigate what the problem is. If it is a plant disease, if it is caused by pest, or is your plant lacking nutrients? What type of nutrient does it lack based on the symptoms that you're seeing? So a good practice is to, is to always monitor your plants whenever you're maintaining your garden because the more you make this an habit, the faster it is for you to pick up when there is something going wrong. Okay, Stacey, you're hoping that it will make a difference. Okay. So Nikki is recommended that Stacey water and shade should help. Okay. Now, here is an advice that I'd like to share with all gardeners. When you're in doubt, don't delay. Ask question whether you're going to do research online or you're going to talk to fellow gardeners, whether you're going to talk to your neighbors that grow similar crops like you. When, you when you're in doubt, don't delay to find out what is going on because the law you wait the worse the problems the problem gets and sometimes you can wait too long where the problem get out of control where the steps that you could have taken before will no longer work so when you're in doubt get a get on it right away let's see what russell says here i have noticed this year slugs problem way down the differences in this year i went back to wood chips oh, okay i went for five years using leaves after previously using wood chips because sorry better moisture retention too okay good good very good yes that's one of the benefits of the wood chips and i think that is saving me this year because over the fall last year for the first time i actually had wood chips mulch and with the heat wave that we have been having it has worked out pretty well. It does save me a lot of watering. I do have to water every day anyway, but the amount of water that I have to use, it's not bad. Let's see, Nikki says, I had a huge slug problem at the beginning of the season. Okay. I'm quite thankful that we don't have snails here bothering my plants. Okay, yes, so 
one thing one thing that you can do with your plants is to when you see that something is wrong with your plants take pictures of it sometimes you see that there's a problem but you don't know what the problem is and therefore you don't know what question to ask so sometimes just whether posting a picture on one of the social media or talking to fellow youtube groups or facebook groups or even your neighbors by showing them pictures of what is going on then they might be able to help you to diagnose the problem but you don't want to delay whenever you see something sometimes you might see creatures that you're not familiar with in your garden you don't know if they are friends or foes to your garden and some gardeners will be very conscious of not harming insects that are friends to the garden and so the first reaction would be to allow it to be there for a while until they it is because you don't want to take action and then find out that you just harm some beneficial insects to your garden so as soon as you start to see insects in your garden and you don't know what it is take pictures of it or do research type in a description of what the insects look like do research on it and try to find out what it is as soon as possible and then by doing so you'll be able to tell whether or not it is okay to have those creatures in your garden or you'll be able to tell if what's happening to your plant is actually a plant disease that you need to be concerned about So taking action very early can save you a lot of unnecessary stress and take it from me <laughs> talking from experience when you find pests early you are able to sometimes depending on the type of pest and how early you catch them sometimes you can completely eradicate the pest or sometimes you can reduce their population or you can reduce the amount of damage that they can do to your plants. Let's see, Melanie says, that's true, Russell. I have one bed with wood chips and I have no slug problems there. Okay, good. That's good. Yes. Keep in mind that pests have memories, just like us, they have memories. And wherever they go and find food this growing season, they are going to remember that, okay, we were able to find this type of food in this location. So we're going to go back to this location to see if that food is available there. So when you keep that in mind, you have several options. You can either choose to rotate your crops so that you will confuse the, plant, the, the pests. Or even if, if you're planting in the same location, then you want to ensure that you get these pest population under control you keep in mind also that some pests are able to overwinter and especially in warmer environments some pests can just keep reproducing year-round in colder environments some pests are able to overwinter in place or they are able to overwinter somewhere close to where your garden is so getting their population under control is the best thing that you can do and the faster you do that the better it is for you let's see melanie says now i have to put wood chips everywhere the wood chips do work they have their own disadvantages but like everything else in life there is advantages and disadvantages but they do work so if that helps with the slug and that's pretty good now why is it so important that you act early when you see insects and other pests in, or other creatures in your garden that you're not familiar with i'm gonna share two examples based on what i have experienced this year regarding pests so the first one is the potato bugs because I'm always looking at my plants daily to see what's going on, 
one morning I went out and I noticed that two of my potato leaves, well, two of my potato plants, the leaves were eaten. And so I started checking underside of the leaves to see if there was anything there. Didn't see any anything, didn't see any eggs, didn't see any insects. So I started checking around the root of the plants and around both plants that had the damage, I noticed a bug. And I did not know what type of bug it is, so I didn't want to destroy the bugs. So I put them in a container and gave them a few leaves and kept them there. And then in the video, I put it on YouTube and I asked, does anybody know what type of animal this is or what type of creature this is? Is it, is it a friend or a foe? I put it on my Facebook groups and I was able to find out that it is potato bugs. So I destroyed the two that I was trying to keep alive. And then every day from then I keep going out and checking. I found a total of about, I think it was six bugs, different times. And after I found the first five bugs, I noticed I'm seeing their eggs but I've never seen any bugs. So for about two weeks, I'm seeing eggs and I'm not seeing any bugs. Eventually, I found the last bugs, bug and after that, I have never seen any more, neither the bug nor their eggs. Neither have any of my various potato beds experience problems from the potato bugs. So the lesson that I learned from this is that Early detection can sometimes eradicate the problem or it can at least reduce it. The next experience that I had, let's see what Russell says here. So far this year, I've had one bell pepper with slug damage. That's it. Okay, that's pretty good. Just one plant. Although we'd rather not have any, but one plant is not bad. Yes, yeah, so the next experience is for a few weeks, I keep noticing these little creatures that I've never seen before. I didn't know if they were friend or foe, but I'm constantly looking at the plants that they're on and I'm not seeing any changes. So I'm thinking, okay, then it might be okay for these insects to be here. But then as time goes by, I started to notice that the leaves of my plants started looking like, oh, what would you call that now? Like this, this plaid <laughs> that I'm wearing. So you start seeing little square patterns or some funny shape patterns over the entire leaves of, the, of my beans. And then I noticed that gradually it started going from my beans to my pumpkin and stuff like that. So after posting pictures again and asking if anyone can identify it, and based on a video that I had seen earlier on a tomato plant, because I started seeing the same problem on my tomato plant, they didn't have the square patterns on them, but the leaves started curling at the top. Then I realized that I'm having an issue. And then after posting and asking, then I realized that I have leaf hoppers and that leaf hoppers spread the curly top virus. Now, because I saw these creatures and for the first two weeks that I saw them, there didn't seem to be any damage to my plants. And so I assumed that it was okay for them to be there. But because I delayed in trying to find out what they were, I ended up with practically my entire garden suffering from curly top virus. And even though I am taking steps to help the plant to cope with the virus, it won't get rid of it, but at least it will strengthen the plants. The damage is still there and it has reduced the amount of production that I'm going to be getting from my plants. So another lesson, don't delay when you see things that you are not certain about. Don't assume that it is okay. Always assume the worst and take action as quickly as possible. Because if I hadn't waited, I could have gotten them under control. But now my entire garden is covered with these pests. 
and most of the time the treatment that is used for them you can use to control them when they're in their young state but when they're in their older state there's nothing you can do about it and the curly top virus has no cure so the plant has to endure with it so again the lesson is always monitor your plants when you see something and you are not certain get on it right away find out what it is see if you need to take action and if you do take action as quickly as possible so the next thing that you can do as a gardener especially if you find that you have the same type of problem recurring year after year is to plan ahead for these type of challenges because as with the example that I just gave, if you don't plan ahead, you can find yourself in a situation where by the time you actually take action, it can be too late. Most pests these days tend to become more and more resilient to the type of pesticide, whether organic or otherwise, that we are using. And so most of the time, the best way to deal with it is to catch them when they are in their young state rather than allowing them to reach to maturity. So if we understand the type of pest that we are having, the various stages that they go through and the various method that works at controlling them, then we are better able to keep our garden healthy. We can reduce the stress that comes from having to be running around trying to fix the problem after it has already occurred, if the problem can be fixed. Yes, so as we go down in the discussion, I'm going to be discussing ways that we can plan ahead for the future, whether it is the next garden season or if you are able to if you have a long garden season where you're going to be doing succession planting, then planning ahead will work out well. And one way that we can plan ahead when it comes to pest control is that there are some pests that prefers early spring. There are some that prefers early summer, late summer or fall. And so knowing the type of pest and the type of season that they tend to come out or the type of weather that they tend to be most active in we and the type of crop that they affect then we can plant our gardens so that we plant outside of these season where possible because sometimes that's not always possible especially if you have a short growing season So some other steps that can be taken regarding planning ahead and especially with these weather extremes that we have been experiencing globally. Some of us may have small gardens. Some of us may have really large garden. So if you experience a lot of heat, for example, as I mentioned before, you can use shade cloth or row cover to cover your garden sometimes that is not necessarily practical because your garden is just too big and the expense that comes with buying these material can be sometimes out of reach so if you have a really large garden what you can do is for crops that you consider to be a must have Say, for example, most gardeners will plant things like tomato, peppers, carrots, and certain vegetables. So if you have a really large garden and you know that you won't be able to use to cover all of your garden with shade cloth and row covers and stuff like that, one of the things that you can do is select a small portion of your garden and all of these things that you consider to be a must-have in your garden, your herbs or whatever, Plant a group of these close to each other, cover that area with shade cloth. That way, even if the time gets too hot, you will at least have some of the things that you consider vital that you can harvest from. The rest, even if they get damaged, depending on how long your growing season is, you might be able to restart them 
But at the same time, all is not lost because you still have an area where you can keep harvesting from. So that is one method that you can use. If you have a small garden, then you can go ahead and cover it with shade cloth. And I'm going to discuss that a little bit further on, especially for people with larger garden. Now, with this pandemic, there are many things that are affected. It's not just health, but financial downturns have increased and it continues to get worse. We're not really expecting it to get better anytime soon. So what you do when you find yourself in that situation where you have financial downturn and you still have to maintain your garden, you would like to get your garden covered with the row covers or a shade cloth, but you cannot afford to do all of your garden all at once, is to take it in stages. So you know that, okay, I don't have the resources to cover all my garden. What about if you buy the material or some of the material to cover just one portion of the garden? And then gradually, when the resources are available, you keep doing that until you get the entire garden cover or the area that you want to have covered. So steps can be taken to ensure that we get the most out of whatever situation we are because the way things are going, nothing is predictable. We cannot say things are going to stay bad permanently. We cannot say it's going to get better permanently in this system of things. So we always have to plan to deal with whatever circumstance we are faced with. So taking things step by step is what we're going to have to do in order to cope with the various changes that we are experiencing. Now, we cannot look and say, okay, it's always hot. So you know what? I'm not going to bother plant because it doesn't make sense. I plant because I'm not going to be able to reap anything or it's always raining. So there's nothing I can do about that. So there is no sense in planting or whatever else it is that we have to do in life. When we are faced with situations, we cannot just give up because if we don't try to adapt to the changes, then we are going to get left behind. And none of us want to be left behind. So bye, Nikki. Yes, yeah, so we have to take steps in order to cope with the changes. And more and more, when you listen to various countries, even tropical countries where farming is a major part of their industry, more and more you hear complaints about farmers having serious issues because of weather changes or financial problems. So we have to find ways to do figure out what works best. Now, my growing season is ending soon. And so one of the things that I've been doing is putting steps in place to ensure that I am keeping up with the changes that occur. So for example, I'm already planning what I'm going to be doing with my garden for fall. I cannot grow anything in fall because my growing season ends in about five, six, seven weeks from now. So there's nothing I can plan for fall. But then what can what steps can I take to ensure that some of the problems that I face this year, I don't face them next year. So I'm already putting plans in place to ensure that next year, some of the issues that have been facing this year, I won't have to face next year. There will be other issues next year because I did plan for a lot of things this year. And for all the problems that I planned for this year, I didn't have an issue with those, but then I had other issues. So every year while we keep planning, new issues keep coming up. But then by planning ahead, we at least prevent some of the issues. Because imagine if I wasn't planning ahead for some of the issues that I had last year, and then I ended up with these issues this year, in addition to the issues that I'm having this year. So it's always good to plan ahead because you want to reduce the amount of problems that may arise. So one of the things that I've been doing is planning, planning out what I'm going to be doing for the fall for my worm farm and for my garden. So 
what I am doing now is preparing my notes because quite a few things changed for me this year with my garden from what I had planned. Oh, hi, Joshua. I just watched your broccoli regrow video. Did flowers ever show up? No, actually, I'm going to be doing a review on that regrow broccoli challenge. I'm going to be doing that pretty soon. But yes, there was never any flowers. Oh, hi, Rodney. Let's see. Russell says, the quickest action I take is dish soap and water in spray bottle. Spray everything, including the underside of the leaves, to kill larvae and eggs. Yes, that works pretty well. Russell says, I don't like the part about dish soap being made from petroleum byproducts and then spraying on living plants, but it works. Yes, it does work. It does work very well, especially when you catch things in the early stages. So that's one method that we can use to get things under control as quickly as possible. And then the good thing is that dish soap is always right at our fingertips. So we don't have to go out to purchase something in order to take care of the issue. So thanks for that reminder, Russell. Yes, so where was I? Yes, so some, some of the things that I've been doing, as I was saying before, because last year, for the first time, I planned out my garden before the growing season start in terms of what I'm going to be companion planted, where each plant is going to be planted, because what I want to do is keep a record of how well the plants perform in that location, what type of is issue the plants faced in that location, um, things like that. And then knowing what I planted where this year, if there's a need for me to rotate the, the crop, then I can rotate them. But this year, because I faced so many issues, a lot of things got planted in locations that they were not originally intended to be planted. So now I have to be creating different notes as to what I planted where. So that is one of the things that I have planning out now for my fall. And then looking into why a particular crop that I grow this year failed. What is it that what caused it to fail? Is it something that I did wrong? Or is it something relating to the natural environment? What steps can I take next year to ensure that I don't have this problem again? So it's quite a few things that I have to be planning. And then one of the things that is of concern is that, like I said before, things don't always go the way you plan. And sometimes you might be working with a schedule and you have a particular thing planned for that particular time, but then circumstances don't allow you to do that. So sometimes a good idea is rather to not get anything done, rotate them. So switch places with what you have planned for now, with what you can do, that what you have planned for later, if you can switch places because time is always important. And with the weather being so crazy, we never really know what's going to happen. So where possible, if we don't get to do something at the time that we plan, try to do something else so that at least the time is well spent. Let's see. Russell says, every other day for three times and one more for good measures, destroy the life cycle of pests that are living in plants in most cases. Yes, because um, based on the various pests that I've had to deal with in the last couple of years and the research that I've done on them, most of them tend to have reproduced like every three, five to six days, five to seven days, they said the eggs tend to hatch. And so it is a good idea, like you said, Russell, every three or so days to take action to destroy their life cycle. We don't want them to reach mat the, the, the eggs or the larvae to reach maturity. And we don't want adults want to be laying eggs. So 
taking steps as often as possible is one very effective way, as you say. Let's see, Rodney says, caterpillars ate through all a lot of our family garden. I found that a lot of it has, was due to spacing. How close you plant things together, depending on the size, pest, and the mode that they use to go from place to place. If the plants are too close, then it's easy for them to transfer from one plant to the other. So there are so many reasons why we need to maintain a proper spacing between our plants. Yes, I agree with you, Russell. Dish soap is definitely cheap and effective compared to other types of pesticides cheap and effective so this year i think it's the first time that i have ever had to deal with so many different types of pests in my garden all at once so some of the pests that i've had to deal with this year I've encountered the potato bugs, I've encountered the cutworms, I've encountered leaf miners, leaf hoppers, cabbage moth, and white flies. So these are some of the pests that I had to deal with this year. Some of them I was able to get under control pretty early. The white flies, it doesn't really take much to get them under control because Worm tea works very well. So once I noticed that I start having them, I just started treating the plants for these white flies. Cabbage moth, um, I haven't seen a lot of them. I don't know if it is because this year I grow less of the brassica family. So I'm not seeing a lot of them, but they are creating some damage to my brassicas. Hi, Janice. It has been a while. How are you doing? Can I give my wigglers the cut leaf from Brussels cabbage and tops of carrots? If so, should I wash them? Wash them boil before freezing them? Uh, let's see now. You can give it to them. I don't know if you want to boil them. I don't think you need to boil them. So if you have those, I would just recommend freezing them and then thaw it and giving it to them. Is there any particular reason why you are thinking of boiling them first? If, that, if you're thinking of boiling them first to soften them, then freezing is going to take care of that because once you freeze them, when they thaw out, they will naturally start breaking down easily. So there's no need to boil them for that reason. Uh, I don't usually wash any food scraps that I am feeding to my worms. Apart from the initial washing, when I harvest the food scraps or washing the, the food to use it in my kit, um, to cook it or to prepare it. Apart from washing it, then I don't usually wash it to just to give it to the worms because the purpose of worms is to break down not just the food scraps but the bacteria and other type of pathogens and stuff like that that is present on the food scraps so there's no need for you to wash it oh unless of course maybe you are trying to wash off things like pesticide in which case, for the most part, the pesticide would have already been inside of that food scraps. So washing it off would not really make much of a difference. Yes, but um, I don't really see a need for you to boil them first. Sometimes with my food scraps, depending on what it is, for example, if it is something that has a lot of seeds like tomatoes or sweet peppers, 
then I will put that in the microwave or pour some boiling water on it in order to kill the seeds. So if it is a case where you have seeds that you're trying to destroy, then boiling them is okay. But beyond that, I don't really see a need for you to boil the food scraps first. Right. So, excuse me. As I was saying about the pests that I have encountered, some of them I was able to get under control pretty early. Some of them I still have to be dealing with because I didn't act fast enough. So between these pests and the curly top virus, the heat wave and the drought, my garden certainly took a beating this year, but thankfully it is still doing okay. Now, one thing that I have learned from this is that no matter how much you prepare for problems with your garden, there will always be other problems that you did not anticipate because you just cannot prepare for everything. Now, what are some of the challenges that you guys have encountered in your garden this year? One other challenge that I have ex experienced this year in my garden is actually over fertilizing because as most of you know in the fall that I was collecting compost and adding compost to my garden so this year for my raised beds when I was adding compost it was not just to supply nutrients to the plant, but I was actually using the compost as a means of filling up my raised bed in addition to the material that was in the raised bed the previous years because some of my raised beds are just a year old, some two or three, four years old. So for those high raised beds that I have, some of them I had just small amount of soil in them. So I was using the compost to build up the volume that is in there. So I ended up with too much nutrients. So based on one of my videos that I did that most of you have seen, I ended up with the plants being burnt from having too much nutrients, especially the nitrogen. And then there's the long-term um, what is it now? The long term crisis resulting from it. Oh, hi, wood chip gardener. So, the long term problem that came from having so much compost because I was adding like six inches of compost to the garden, and really, you don't need more than two inches. But as I said, I was using it as a filler. So, the long term problem that I ended up with is that my plants tend to have a lot more foliage. But then, because of the high nitrogen content, that creates the foliage, but at the same time, it reduces the amount of flowers that each plant would normally produce. So, don't add too much fertilizer to your garden. Just what you need. Don't add too much nitrogen to your garden. Just what you need because... If you do, it is going to reduce the amount of flowers that your plants produce because the plant is, once it has the nitrogen, it is not going to be focusing on flowering. It's going to be focusing on producing foliage. So for those who experience a lot of rainy season during the the growing season um, let's see Rosa says I used the dish soap method this year on tomatillos it took out the three lined potato beetles oh nice yeah that's good to know so if I see the potato beetles coming I know that I can use the dish soap for that too thanks for sharing yes yeah, so for those who experience too much rain this growing season one thing to keep in mind is that some of the nutrients that your plants need is water soluble especially the nitrogen and this means that when you get a lot of rain it's going to deplete the amount of nitrogen that is in your garden and especially so 
in raised beds that always tend to require more frequent fertilizer being added. And when I talk about fertilizer, I never ever recommending artificial fertilizers. It's always organic. Yes, so it always, the rain water will deplete the amount of nitrogen or the water soluble nutrients in your soil. So if you have a lot of rain, then it's going to be necessary for you to top up your garden with more nitrogen. So one very quick method that you can use to top up your garden with nitrogen is by using freshly cut grass clippings and weeds that you've just pulled up. You can apply it to the garden directly or you can create a compost tea with it and then use that to water the plants. Now, when you use it to water the plant because when you create the compost tea and use that to water the plants, because it is in the liquid state, it's going to be absorbed by the plants faster than if you just take the leaves and put it around the plants, because then it's going to take longer for the plant, for the grass clippings to break down and for the plants to uptake it. But when you put it in water, the water encourage the plant to break down faster. So creating the worm tea is the fastest way that you can actually ensure that the plants will uptake the nitrogen fast enough let's see melanie says cabbage worms but got it under control and harvested 12 pounds of cabbage so far nice that's very nice yeah see i didn't grow a lot of cabbage well i don't usually grow a lot of cabbage apart from the chinese cabbage i've always wanted to grow a lot of but it seemed for whatever reason, I'm not going to have a lot of Chinese cabbage, but regular cabbage, I don't really have a lot of those either. I don't know what's going on with most of my cabbages. The Chinese cabbage, they are being eaten by some form of pest that I still cannot see up to this point. I'm still not seeing what is eating them because... I am not seeing any of the cabbage moth around it, nor am I seeing any of their larvae around it. I'm not seeing any pests at all on it, but the leaves are being eaten anyway. For the other brassicas that I'm growing, they definitely, I see the cabbage moth and their larvae on it. So I know that's what's eating it. So, yes, but it's good. 12 pounds of cabbage, that's pretty good. The cabbage head that I would like to grow, it's very difficult for me to find to find the seeds for it because all the cabbage that I see growing in my region, they tend to have the stems of it is very thick. The foliage of it is very thick. They last longer when they have thicker stems and thicker foliage, but... I don't like that variety because it's too chewy. So I like the type of cabbage head that tends to be thin and the veins in it is thin. But for whatever reason, I can't seem to find those seeds here. Yes, I'd have to probably get someone from Jamaica to ship some to me. But yes. Okay, so as I was saying, making the compost tea is... A pretty good way to help the plants with nutrients after the rain has depleted the nitrogen. Now, as I mentioned before, too much nitrogen re reduces the, the flowering of your plant. So there's a step that you can take to ensure that your plants will produce enough flowers so that you can have whatever fruit it is supposed to produce. So one, you're going to, once you see that your plant is ready to start flower, do not feed it nitrogen. Pruning your plants where possible is going to help the plants to stop focusing on creating more foliage. You want to um, prune the plant to reduce the amount of foliage that is there. And then another thing that you can do is 
add just a small amount of phosphorus to your plants that are flowering because phosphorus help to improve or increase flowering. But you don't want to add too much phosphorus because that can be damaging to your plants as well. But yes, a nice supply of phosphorus will help with the flowering of your plants. And speaking of which, I need to add some bone meal to my to my garden at the moment because since uh, some of my raised bed has the issue where I have too much compost in there, so the foliage is there, but a lot of them are not producing the amount of flowers that they should. So I'm definitely gonna have to add some of my bone meal to it in order to increase the foliage okay guys so it has been another successful live and in a few minutes if you guys do not have anything to share i am going to be saying goodbye Thank you all for your participation. Let's see what Rosa says here. I tried some popcorn microgreens yesterday and today. They came out of one of my main bins doing experiment in cocoon buckets. Okay. Yes, I'm looking forward to the update on that. Definitely looking forward to the update on that. I'm not very successful with microgreens. Didn't try any this year though, but hopefully next year I'll be able to to try it out. Okay, so it was nice talking to you guys. Thanks for all your participation, for being here and supporting the live, sharing all of those practical experiences that you've had so that others including myself, can benefit from it. Let's see. Blue chip Garner says, in my era, we haven't had rain for 48 days. Tied in a third place. Wow. 48 days, I think you, we, you and I are in a similar boat. We haven't had rain. Let's see. From spring started, we've had two partially, well, one good shower, one that is not too bad for about 15 minutes. And since then, we've probably had maybe three drizzling of rain. That's all we've had from spring started until now. <laughs> yeah, it has been it has been pretty bad. I've never really seen a summer like this before in this region. But yeah, I guess the water bill is going to be pretty high trying to maintain the garden. And then... In addition to the drought, if we were just having drought but not having the heat wave, it would not have been so bad. But with the heat wave, it means that you have to be using far more water than usual. But I guess that's all a part of it. Yeah. Okay, you're welcome, Stacy. Let's see, Melanie says, pruning the cucumbers, send them crazy. Can't keep up with the harvest. Nice, nice. Yeah, um, this year my cucumbers are few. They're not as much as I would expect because practically all that I started from seeds, I, they died. The few that remain, they didn't do so well. So I had to purchase cucumbers, so I don't really have a lot this year. And even the ones that I purchased, for the most part, I think, maybe two of the plants seem to be doing exceptionally well the other two are okay and then i think the other three or four are just like whatever but yes that's good to know you're having su success with your cucumbers as well let's see stacy says thank you for such amazing info you're most welcome stacy Okay, so thank you guys for being here and for all your participation. I hope that you will have a wonderful week. Stay safe and happy gardening.
Okay, hi Han White. <laughs> yeah, I have to say hi to you before I go. Tired lady. Okay, take care and see you again hopefully on Friday.